Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my iPhone says it's time to start. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's um, departmental seminar um, on a. Oops, I better turn my phone off. On a um, cryptographic key distribution system, uh, keeping the cryptographic key secret, and how do we do that? And this is an interesting way to try to do it classically. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Lockman Gunn, who's going to give the talk. He graduated here both in Eleknge and Applied Math, and uh, he won the Mazumda Prize, so did very well. And he's also done quite a number of summer scholarships at the Defence Science and Technology Organisation, and also worked at Mind Lab for a little while, and so got his hands dirty with some real electronics. So he's the right guy to do this particular project. So without further ado, let's give him a big hand. All right, thanks, Derek. So I'm going to talk about a key distribution method called the Kish Key Distribution System. So just a quick show of hands. Who here knows anything about cryptography? Good. Um, it's not going to be wasted on you then. Uh, Sorry. So, almost all encrypted data now is used what uses what's called symmetric encryption. So this is the sort of old-fashioned, the old-fashioned style of cryptography, where you and someone else have a secret key, and you can take your cipher wheel or whatever it is you're using, and you take your message and turn the wheels to each other, and uh, you turn one letter into another letter, and you need to know that special key to turn them back. So the two parties need to have a secret key. But the problem is, how do you agree on that secret key? You have to send it to each other or otherwise agree on it. So the really old-fashioned way was to use couriers. So this is an example of one that was used by the KGB that was captured by the Canadians uh, in the early 60s. So they had their little book with tiny, uh, with tiny letters and numbers printed on it that. Uh, that they would then use for their codes. And so that also had a micro dot reader, so it sort of shows you the level of technology that's involved in some of this stuff. But that was very secure and it was almost impossible to break. But couriers are really expensive and time consuming and they get captured and uh, there are all sorts of other problems. So there has to be a better way and maybe we can use maths and engineering to solve this problem. So the first uh, real solution to this came in the early 70s. So there was a solution that was developed at GCHQ, so the equivalent of the NSA or the, D or the DSD, which is now the ASD. Um, so they developed this solution that was really nice and it used number theory, but being a government signals intelligence organisation, they weren't terribly forthcoming with information. And so we only discovered, uh, we only discovered that they knew about this in 1997. But fortunately, all of this was repeated uh, very quickly by coincidence and academics found these same methods. So in 1976 Diffie and Hellman published a paper and it was called New Directions in Cryptography and this wasn't really an understatement at all. Uh, the idea was that two people could agree by essentially shouting across the room they could agree on a secret key. So I can shout some numbers at someone in the back of the room they shout some numbers back and then we can perform our little procedure and we'll both have a secret key that we both know and we both agree on but no one else in the room can figure out by listening to what we've said. But the problem is that this depends upon the difficulty of a problem in mathematics. It's called the discrete logarithm problem. So you can exponentiate a number, uh, the same as with the real numbers, but if you do so using modular arithmetic, so you take your exponential, then find the remainder modulo some number, and you can keep doing this. And it turns out to be really difficult to undo this procedure. Now, if someone finds a solution and finds an easy way to do this, then we'll be in a lot of trouble because this sort of, uh, this sort of problem is the basis for all modern public key cryptography, which is what this is called, where you don't need to agree on a secret key beforehand. So, an alternative to this, which came about a few years later, is called uh, quantum cryptography. 
So briefly, instead of using the hardness of solving a discrete logarithm or factorising a large number, it uses the no cloning theorem. So it tries to use physical principles that you can't get around to guarantee security. But the problem is, if you pr try to prove the security of a physical system, you have to have a model of all of the physical bits and pieces of that system. And if your model is incomplete, then your security proof is invalid, as was found out um, when these systems, which are available commercially, uh, were able to, was discovered that they could be hacked by essentially shining a laser down the fibre. So this was a problem, and there have been countermeasures to prevent this. But it raises the question of how do you prove a system is secure and whether physical systems are sufficiently trustworthy. So for the moment, these computational schemes are still uh, number one. But while quantum gives the opportunity to give perfect security, there's another problem. Because in 1995, there was an algorithm invented for quantum computers called Shor's algorithm. So it solves this problem which is uh, much like the discrete logarithm problem. a to the k equals e finds the smallest k for which that's the case. Which might sound uh, unobtrusive enough, but in fact this breaks every public key cryptography scheme in common use. So this breaks RSA, it breaks Diffie-Hellman, it breaks elliptic curve cryptography. And in short, if uh, large quantum computers are built and become commonplace, all cryptography in use at the moment is essentially useless. So the race is on to sort of find uh, alternatives to the current methods that aren't vulnerable to quantum computing before someone, uh, before someone finds a good one. But just to give an idea of the current status, uh, I think the, this algorithm can be used to factorise numbers, so you can break a number to, down into its prime factors. Now the current record, I believe, is They've shown that 35 is equal to 7 times 5, under the assumption that it factors 7 and 5. So there's still some way to go. But a lot of people are worried that there's going to be a big breakthrough and we'll all be in trouble. So what would still be secure even if large quantum computers came to exist? Well, couriers obviously are still safe. No matter how much computational power you have, you can't really look inside someone's briefcase. Symmetric cryptography will also still work because this tends to be based upon alarming levels of uh, complexity. So you take a function that's really terrifying and nonlinear, and you get your message, you mix in some key material, put it through this nonlinear function, mix in some more key material, put it through the nonlinear function again, and repeat this maybe 20 times. And eventually the key and the message just become so horribly and irrevocably mixed that an attacker, even knowing what the message is, can't work out what the key is. And quantum computing doesn't provide a way to break this completely. It lets you do it a little bit faster, but not enough that it's a serious problem. There are other alternatives which have been proposed, uh, things like lattice-based cryptography, code-based. Uh, there are some others based upon elliptic curves. But these aren't in common use because they have their problems. For the most part, they're computationally expensive, and they also need very large keys. To give an idea, an elliptic curve key at the moment might be, say, 300 bits in size. Uh, an R a key using RSA might be 2,000 bits. And one with code-based cryptography might be a megabyte. So it's a fairly big difference, and if you need to keep a lot of these around, then these alternatives aren't necessarily going to work for you uh, right now. So that's why they haven't been put into place as yet. Quantum cryptography, as I mentioned before, is another proposed alternative that doesn't give you a replacement for public key cryptography. You can't really use it to talk to your bank, but it's better than nothing in that it will stop an eavesdropper that's just listening to your wireless. Well, wireless isn't perhaps the best example, but, but it will stop an eavesdropper that's trying to listen to your link from, from uh, getting all of the information that goes across it. But this is expensive and it's environmentally sensitive in the sense that you've got optics and single photon detectors and single photon sources and vibration and temperature and all of those sorts of things generally conspire against uh, anything with that level of precision. So there's some interest in developing other systems that don't suffer from these problems. And one of these is 
the KKD scheme, also known as the KLJN scheme. So the Kishki distribution scheme is classical. It doesn't need single photon sources or single photon detectors, which is a big deal because a single photon detector, which is an avalanche, generally an avalanche photodiode, it might cost a couple of hundred dollars. Um, so it's obviously not something that you can easily put into a small device. So this system doesn't need any of that. It just uses some resistors and some voltage sources and some switches. So the idea is you take a resistor and this resistor is going to produce thermal noise. So you imagine you're just holding a resistor in your hand and you measure the voltage across it. So you look at an oscilloscope and you're going to see some fluctuations due to thermal noise. And Shannon, sorry not Shannon, Nyquist showed uh, in the 30s I believe that this is going to produce a noise if you measure across a certain bandwidth B that this is going to produce a level of noise proportional to the bandwidth and proportional to the temperature and proportional to the resistor. And so we can use these properties, as I'll show. So what's the mean square voltage of that line going to be with the two resistors? And if that line is really short, you can essentially see that as being two resistors in parallel. So you take the formula that Nyquist computed, and which is 4 KTBR, and then just substitute in RA parallel with RB, and that gives you that mean squared voltage. For convenience of the numbers, I'm going to set 4 KTB equal to 2, and RA and RB can be equal to 1 or 2 volts. So you have two resistors, and you use a switch that you can connect uh, either of these to each end. So if RA, and sorry, if Alice and Bob, so Alice is at one end and Bob is at the other, so if Alice sets her resistor RA to be 1 ohm, and Bob does the same thing, then you'll see that with the trickery of setting 4 kdB equals 2, you get a mean squared voltage on the line of 1. Now if Alice and Bob have picked 2 ohm, both picked 2 ohms, then you get 2 volts along the line. The resistance is doubled, so you'd expect that. But the interesting things start to happen when one's picked 1 ohm and one's picked 2 ohms. In that case, you get this 1.33 volts. Either way, so you've got these, so you've got this table here, where it can either be so the voltage across the line can either be one volt, two volt, or one point three three. So this voltage is measured by Alice and Bob, and so they'll look at that and say, okay, well that voltage is one point three three volts. I've picked one ohm for my resistor, so therefore the guy at the other end must have picked two ohms, or vice versa. So Alice and Bob, they can distinguish between those two cases because they know which resistor they've chosen. But an eavesdropper, who can just measure the voltage on the line and doesn't know which resistor's been chosen at each end, that eavesdropper can just see that it's 1.33 volts. So I know that it's in one of these two cases, one of these two cases, but I don't know which of those is. So this lets you communicate, as we say. We let this state, for example, represent a zero, this one represent a one. So Alice and Bob can tell, okay, we've both pick, we've picked zero together, so let's use that as our key. And repeat this over and over again, and if they find that well, they've both picked the same one, then they just throw that away. So a little example that's uh, a practical one, so this is experimental data. So if Alice and Bob have both picked the small resistor, they get this low voltage here. It's LL for low, low. If they both pick the high resistor, then they get a higher voltage up here. And if they, one has picked a low resistor and one's picked a high resistor, then they get this one, LH, which is in the middle. And you get the same thing with the currents. So they can't differentiate between uh, low, high, and high, low. Because <coughs> down here, if we have a look at this voltage, you can actually see, if you look very closely, there are two histograms there. Sorry, I should have mentioned these are histograms of voltage, measured voltage. So there are actually two histograms there. One represents Alice picking a big resistor and Bob picking a small one, and one represents the other way around. And you can see that they're almost identical. Uh, in fact, they're essentially identical as far as measurement uh, error. I'll come back to this graph 
a bit later because those uh, are slightly different. So how do we analyse this system and how do we show it's secure? I, I briefly considered when I was uh, writing this talk, when I was talking about Diffie-Hellman, to try to set up a demonstration and agree to shout numbers across the room with someone and we'd both get our little calculator out and work out the secret key. But then I thought, well, everyone listening, they don't know how to, they don't know how to compute this secret key. But how do you know that there isn't some way that you've not figured out? And that's the problem with security analysis. It's hard to find a good enough model that will let you demonstrate that a system is secure. You can find attacks against it so you can demonstrate that it's not secure, but demonstrating that something is secure is a lot more difficult. So the approach that we take to security analysis for this system is we construct a model of the system. Unfortunately, this necessarily means making assumptions. Uh, but so we have to try to construct a model of the system. Then we map the measurements that the eavesdropper makes, or that the eavesdropper is able to make, to this system state. So we can compute statistical distributions for what the eavesdropper is able to measure in each case. We then compare these measurement distributions for the two configurations of resistors and see whether they're different. And if an eavesdropper can't distinguish between those two choices of resistors, then the system is secure. So imagine just a simple lumped model. So imagine that line is essentially very, is essentially zero length. So it's not really a transmission line, it's just a line on your schematic. So an eavesdropper can measure the voltage and current through the line. Now the mean squared voltages are identical, which we showed before on that table and in the graphs. And if you work it out, work out the math score, the mean squared currents are the same. There's a little bit of subtlety here in that because we're using simulated thermal noise, we have to pick a temperature for these resistors that determines the voltage. So that was the T in the 4KTB. Now if we pick the same T at each end, then the resistors are in thermal equilibrium. And so by the second law of therm thermodynamics, you can't have power flowing from one end to the other, because otherwise one resistor would spontaneously cool down and the other one would heat up and you could use it to build perpetual motion machines, and that would be upsetting to a lot of people. So, it means that the product of voltage and current, which is the power being absorbed by each resistor, that has to be zero, no matter what the configuration is. So, we can turn all of this into a covariance matrix. <coughs> so, we can find this voltage here, and this is the current going through those resistors, and this is the product of voltage and current, which is not correlated. But if you squint at that, uh, you can see that that matrix doesn't change if you swap RH and RL. So if one is, sorry, if, so you can swap the high and low at each end. And that doesn't change the distribution of the measurements that an eavesdropper can make. Therefore, the idealised lumped model system that I've just shown is secure, because the eavesdropper can't differentiate using the measurements available between those two cases. But the question then is how accurate is this model? Because as I said before, a proof of security is only as good as the model that it's based on. So sure and you have uh, considered what would happen with line resistance here. So there's a, essentially there's a fault in this transmission line, uh, namely that it's not perfectly lossless. Which for a short line you might think, well it's good enough, but as you start getting towards things that are kilometres long, this becomes much more of a problem. So what does this mean for security? Well, if we look at the leftmost end of the line, we can find the voltage. We can find the voltage that appears <coughs> as a product of the voltage generators at each of the two ends. And you can do some circuit analysis and you come up with this not entirely horrific expression. And then you can compute the mean squared voltage there, which is this, down here. Now if you stare at that for a while, then you notice that if you swap RA and RB, so if you swap the resistors at each end, this voltage changes. So it means that that mean squared voltage now leaks information. And so the eavesdropper can get some information on that bit, and with enough time and enough measurements, that eavesdropper can tell what you've agreed on and what your key is. 
So how big is the difference between these? Well, as it turns out, it's actually not that big and it's quite hard for an eavesdropper to get uh, a good estimate of what you've chosen. So you can calculate this and get this reasonably nice expression for the difference between the mean squared voltages at each end. And with these more reasonable numbers for what you'd see in a practical system, you find that the mean squared voltage on the line is about one volt squared. So it's quite, you know, it's a reasonable voltage. It's uh, quite a respectable level. But the difference between those mean squared voltages at each end is only a thousandth of that. And this, you cannot differentiate between these and the reasonable number of samples. Uh, in essence, it is, say, 1,000, so uh, 30 dBs uh, below. And to differentiate between these, you need thousands, if not millions, of samples. So this on its own isn't a great threat to security. But we'll see later that uh, this can be revived. The next attack that was brought up took advantage of temperature and accuracy in the sources. Because we don't use, we don't use uh, hot resistors to generate these because to get a reasonable voltage you need a really high temperature on the order of 10 to the 18 Kelvin. So in practice you look at the model, the normal model of a noisy resistor. It's just a noiseless resistor and you have a voltage source in so <coughs> right? You have a voltage source in series with it that has the right voltage for that resistor. And that voltage source will have a voltage mean squared voltage for KTBR. Now, when you generate these voltages, you need to have an accurate T. And if that T is off, then you get power flowing between the two ends of the transmission line. So if VA is a higher temperature, you get power flowing through here trying to heat up RB. And so this gives an eavesdropper a way to tell who's picked which resistor. So let's take an exaggerated example where the temperature of one of the resistors is doubled. Then the mean squared voltage you can work out to have this expression. So we calculate what the calculate our table again. So we can find what the voltage will be on the line if R A and R B are both equal to one or both equal to two. So you get your really small and really large voltage. But then these two voltages here, which were previously distinguishable, now they start to differ. So an eavesdropper looking at the voltage on the line can see whether they've picked this one or this one and so whether the key is going to be a zero or a one. So this is a problem. As the temperature difference increases, these states become more and more distinguishable. So you see that with the, here where the temperature ratio is equal to one, it is secure, the temperatures are equal. This uh, line here is if Alice has picked a small resistor relative to a reference voltage. And this is the voltage that you measure on the line if Alice has picked a large one. So you find as the temperature ratio increases, that large voltage is gonna differ more and more from the small voltage. And so those states, the ones that represent, one that represents a zero and the one that represents a one, more and more distinguishable by the attacker. So to make the system secure, you have to match these temperatures really closely. So before we look at the next uh, attack, we'll talk about some experimental work that was done in 2008. In this case, they used a model line, which was a 200 ohm resistor. Because for reasons which I won't go into at this point, you need to keep the bandwidth in the system fairly low. And so delays in the line, in the transmission line are relatively small and <coughs> capacitance doesn't become a major problem because you can use extra circuitry to try to cancel that out. Again I won't go into that, there's a lot of finicky details in this uh, system which have been dealt with uh, but complicated. So they uh, implemented all of these attacks to see what was possible. So this is that graph again that I showed you before, this is for the Shoei River attack. So I said before that these two histograms were the same. So the one corresponds to a zero and one corresponds to a one. So I said before they're identical, but actually they're slightly different. You can't really see it very well on the histogram. But they are differentiable. 
and if you're a very, very uh, patient, you can get about 0.1, sorry, about 0.2% of the bits successfully. So this isn't a huge information leak, and as it turns, so as it turns out, this attack isn't a problem in practice. The how attack, using temperature errors or voltage errors essentially in those terminals, is also ineffective. Uh, it didn't leak any measurable information. So they used 12-bit analog to digital converters in the system. So they were able to keep that temperature reasonably accurate. Now the theoretical information in leak in this case is <coughs> I'm not going to say what that number is, I'm pretty sure it's 10 to the negative 11, but it's not uh, enough that you're going to lose much security over it. But next came an analysis by Bennett and Bridal. So they argued on physical and information theoretical grounds that this system can't be secure. So rather than look at problems with the line or problems with the voltage sources, which an implementer could fix. They looked at the physics of the system, so they said, okay, so maybe there isn't anything wrong with the system. Maybe you've managed to make this perfectly ideal system, but there's a problem with the space in between those two terminals. You can't actually jump information over, you can't jump information over space like you've got a wormhole. Uh, you need to send that information through somehow or other. There's no escaping that. So they argued that Maxwell's equations have this property of being locally causal. So the eavesdropper can't be avoided. And if you take a directional coupler, you can measure the waves travelling in each direction along this line. And that gives all of the information necessary to construct what Alice and Bob can measure. And therefore, as there are some information theoretic results on this, the secrecy rate is zero. So the secrecy rate, C sub S, it's the maximum possible rate of secret communication. It's kind of like the cryptographic equivalent to the Shannon rate. So the Shannon rate tells you you've got this channel and some properties, and it tells you how much information you can pump through. Well, the secrecy rate is similar. So you have your channel and you have some properties of the eavesdropper. And the secrecy rate is a rate such that you can put this, much, this many bits of information through each symbol. And if you code it properly, the eavesdropper will get as close to no information as is possible. So if that rate is greater than zero, the system is unconditionally secure against an attack, no matter how uh, much computational power they have. And the problem is, uh, Bennett and Rowe argued that this system has a secrecy rate of zero. And so, at least in theory, it's not going to provide security. This has been argued against since. Um, it has been argued by the originator of the system that this causality property of Maxwell's equations fails to hold. The reason for that being that there are near field effects which complicate the process and that the use of a directional coupler doesn't really give you the whole story. We've argued against this. Uh, argues against this with physical arguments. I'm not going to go into great detail about this because it's a somewhat long and tedious uh, thing that doesn't really add much information beyond it goes one way or the other and if it's the case it's secure, if not it's not. But the problem is that even if this is the case, even if the secrecy rate is zero and so theoretically the system is secure, for a system that doesn't offer any security it's really quite difficult to break. So Maybe there's a flaw in this information theoretical argument. Maybe there is some complicated physics or maths, uh, some weirdness going on that means that actually it's more secure than it looks at first. So we've had a go at doing an attack against the system and we tried building a directional coupler like was suggested by Bennett and Rydell and we've had a paper that just came out yesterday. So the way we did this, we built this directional coupler so how do you build that in a way that will work at very low frequencies and you can be reasonably certain is actually acting like a directional coupler and separating waves out of each direction? Well, the D'Alembert solution to the wave equation 
looks like this. You've got left travelling wave and a right travelling wave, and you take the sum of those, and that gives you the voltage at each point along the line. So if you look at this equation, you see that the x part has a different sign in each of these. And so when you take the spatial derivative, this one, the right travelling wave, will be flipped in sign. Whereas it won't be when you take the time derivative. And so this means that you can take a linear combination of these derivatives and then use that to get the left and right travelling wave separately. So we measure these derivatives and so you find the waves going in each direction. The time derivative is, is easy, you just use a differentiator. So we sample it with an ABC and just find the difference between consecutive samples. But the spatial derivative is a little bit harder. So the way we do that is we take a delay line, insert that into the line. You can imagine this in a practical system if someone was attacking, that they would make a little tap into the line and measure the voltage on the centre conductor. So we measure the difference in voltage at these two points using an instrumentation amplifier. So this has a gain of about 2,000. Now in practice, the voltage across this delay line for reasonable frequencies and voltages, that's about 35 microvolts. So we go to a gain of 2,000 and that brings it to a level where you can reasonably sample it. But the problem, part of the problem is that okay, all of these circuit elements are imperfect and their parameters are unknown. So that delay line, it's a piece of coaxial cable, it's about a metre long, metre and a half long. But it's lossy, so it's got resistance. And we don't know what the propagation speed is or any of that. So rather than just using a simple differentiator, we use an adaptive filter and use least mean squares to calibrate that so that it will find the left and right travelling waves. So once we did this, we tested this by using it as a vector network analyzer. Sorry, not a vector network analyzer. We used it as a reflectometer that can measure the real part of a reflection coefficient. So you can put a resistor on the end, or a short, or an open, and you'll see plus one reflection coefficient for an open, minus one for a short. You put 50 ohms on the end, you get no reflection. So that suggested that our directional coupler was working like a directional coupler. Now, ignoring all the propagation delays, you can do the maths for this and work out, OK, the wave's travelling in each direction along that line. They'll have this covariance matrix, and this completely defines the state of the line. So if you squint at that for long enough, you'll see that when alpha is equal to 1, so alpha is the loss, so if alpha is equal to 1, then there's no loss, this bit disappears, this bit disappears, and you get this term here, which is nice and symmetric. You can sort of buy off A and B and nothing happens. These are already symmetric, so no change. And so when there's no loss, then swapping the resistors at each end makes no difference, and the attack will fail. So this is a bit of a disappointment. It suggests that propagation delays would be necessary if we want to make an attack like Mendel and Rydell have suggested. However, if alpha is less than 1, the system leaks information because these this covariance matrix will change. But we said before, losses didn't work, and that was shown experimentally. So why would we expect to be able to do better now if it's the same flaw? Well, we use more efficient statistical techniques. Before, we just looked at the differences in mean squared voltages at each end of the line. But we can do better, and we can find the Bayesian estimator that will take into account those big correlations, because that correlation term in the covariance matrix, it's not a little thing. It's almost as large as the entire variances. So you can do a lot better with good statistical technique. As an example, well, how much more efficient? So we used, so that should be a two metre line. And had, we used a two metre line which had about 0.1 dB of loss. So. As a system, this is a very, very optimistic system for communicating between two people about as far apart as my heart. And if you ignore those correlations, so act like, uh, so act like the, the uh, you, show you your river tech, then you get these test statistics, and you can see that those two. You can see the probability densities of, those, of that test statistic doesn't change when you swap the resistors. So the solid line will be a zero and the dashed line will be a one. 
so not much changes. But when you start taking into account those correlations, so you use the full Bayesian estimator based on that covariance matrix, the situation becomes a lot better. The test statistic will be quite noticeably varied as you change from a 0 to a 1. Now they look quite similar, I know, but in fact you don't need to take that many samples to be able to differentiate those two. And in practice, when we did this experimentally, you only needed about 20 to make a pretty reliable guess. And again, this is 0.1 dB, and if you have more loss, like you would in a realistic system, they'll become even more differentiable. So this is our experimental results. So we built one of these systems and built the directional coupler that I just talked about before. And so this is the, on the y-axis, this is the error rate of the eavesdropper. So we looked, we set either a zero or a one, made these measurements and applied that estimator. <coughs> and the eavesdropper tried to guess what those bits were, which bit had been chosen. And this is the rate at which the eavesdropper made an error. On the x-axis is the averaging time. So you might only have one bit lasting for a short time or it might last for a very long time. And as you reduce that time, it becomes more difficult for the legitimate people, so Alice and Bob, it becomes more difficult for them to reliably work out whether it's a zero or a one. But as you can see, as that correlation time increases, sorry, as that averaging time increases, the error rate will drop sharply. Now in practical systems, they're talking about using 11 correlation times, which is down here. And so you see that with that two metre line, so this blue one is 0.1 dB, so two metres of, um, two metres of cable, that's about a 2% error rate. So the eavesdropper can get about 98 or 99% of bits correctly even with that tiny amount of loss in two metres of coaxial cable. Now, if you increase the loss, things become worse and worse. Um, in fact, with 11 correlation times, we weren't actually able to measure the error rate for 0.2 dB, so about four metres of cable uh, equivalent, or one dB of loss. So this is pretty catastrophic if you are hoping for security for the basic system. But the question then is, well, what can we do? This looks quite damning, but maybe there's a countermeasure. And there is. So Kish introduced a really stunningly simple countermeasure for all uh, resistance-based attacks. So this, like this attack that uses loss, or the original Shoei River attack that just used a lumped model. So you just declare the line to be part of one of the resistors. So you might say, well, OK, we've got this resistance total resistance going around that loop. Well, we can just say that that small resistor, actually it should be a little bit larger, and just take into account that extra resistance. And so you just set the noise voltage appropriately. So you've picked a temperature, and that voltage will be 4 kTB times R, the R that you've put in, plus the R of the cable. And then the system will once again be secure. And surprisingly, it doesn't matter which resistor you've chosen uh, to incorporate the line or where along the line you measure or any of that. So the system will once again be secure. But what can be done in the future? Well, there hasn't been entirely rigorous analysis done. The current claims of security all use simplifying assumptions. So the tendency is to work in the quasi-static limit that ignores issues with wave propagation. But convincing security proof shouldn't rely on simplifications. It needs to allow for propagation time, non-linearities, oddities, because Murphy's Law um, is especially sure in security where your attackers are going to do everything they can to make sure that what can go wrong, go wrong. And so you can't leave any room for error. So one thing we could do is analyse a discrete time version of the system. So could this be more easily broken? And can we apply these techniques to the continuous time system that we've shown up here that uses circuits? There's a gulf between these theoretical and practical results. Um, we've shown that, well, it's po okay, it's possible to make the system as close as 
needs to completely secure in practice. But if you believe the information theoretic results that have been put forward, the system shouldn't provide any security. So there's a quite a big gap between almost perfection and nothing. And it would be quite nice to know whether there's some flaw in the information theoretic results, which would be utterly revolutionary, or whether there is uh, an attack that's just not been found yet, or whether maybe in practice the system will be secure in the same way that current public key cryptography is secure by computational reasons. Maybe an eavesdropper would have to be able to measure things much more accurately than is reasonably possible in order to break the system. So that's it for me. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, okay, so So you could have a system that works like it looks like this. We've got Alice's voltage. Voltage. Yeah. And in the middle you've got this transmission line which let's say acts just like a resistor. So in our original group we showed that if this were if this resistance is zero, so that's to that RC, if that resistance is zero, then the system is secure. But the problem is that once you have this resistance in here, um, these voltages aren't quite what's expected. One way to look at that is that resistance is cold while these are extremely hot and power flows into that resistor. So instead of saying, well, okay, let's just give up, we can say that instead of uh, saying, okay, well, that's not part of the cable, we can't do anything about that. Let's say that these are really one resistor here. And so this isn't just VB, it's VB plus VC. So now this transforms. You won't see this. So this actually transforms back into the original system, the original secure system. Because you end up with a perfect line here that just acts like a wire, a perfect wire. So this is exactly the same. It's the perfect ideal system. Right. But yeah. does Shin intruder can't break the unity of the RC and the RB? Well, as it turns out, if you go through and do the maps, um, it doesn't matter if the eavesdropper can look part way through the resistor. No. So it turns out you'll they'll just think that the temperature is slightly different than it is. Um, but it doesn't make any difference to the security of the system. Um, that one I can't quite hand wave, you'll just have to take my word that I've done the maths and it um, and it works. Any other sorry, does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, there's the time delay issue, isn't there? Yes. But uh, if I could, if I'm an intruder and I break that resistor in two places, I've got some resistance and I've got some time delay. Does that change things? Yeah. So that gives you some greater ability. Uh, this is where I said before, without going into detail, that you need to try to keep the bandwidth of this noise fairly low. And the reason is that you want the reflections that come back to be correlated with 
the voltage that's being pumped in by this uh, voltage source. You want them to be correlated because then it means an attacker looking at the reflections, uh, looking at the voltage coming in and the reflections going back out, can't just cross correlate and determine what that reflection coefficient is. Um, when you have some propagation delay, then this lumped model does start to break down. But it just starts to break down. It doesn't completely break down as far as I can tell. Um, and this is where the information theoretic results start to come into play, because it's not entirely clear whether, once you've done a complete analysis that takes into account that big geometric series of reflections, um, delayed reflections, whether it'll actually turn out to be completely insecure once you take all of that into account. So that's yeah, an interesting uh, problem that will still need to be solved. It seems like the security is inherent because um, the only way of knowing the transmitter state is to know the receiver state simultaneously. Are there other systems that can um, use that secure property perhaps faster than integrating a very small noise uh, voltage that would allow communication with this kind of mutual state measurement channel thing? That's something, yes, I would very dearly like to know that. Um, I mean, what I'm not sure. No, what I'm not sure is whether that, um, whether that actually is the case. Whether that internal state really is independent of what the eavesdrop can measure going across the wire. If that turns out to be so, or at least partially independent, then that means that you can do clever things like this and potentially find something that you could even do maybe just in software. Um, and that would be a huge, huge revolution to be able to do information theoretic security without needing to do a one-time patch, so send a courier with a key. It also seems that if you can just do this faster, yeah. you could send raw bits over the channel. You, you don't need to encrypt, they can't measure it. Um, yeah, if you just send raw bits over the channel, then the attacker is going to know a bit about the statistics of it, and they'll they have, have someone. more chances to figure it out, I guess. Yeah. And as well, if you need to pick randomly, because otherwise, because um, otherwise you you need to get that state where one's picked in, one's picked high and one's picked low, so you both need to pick randomly um, in order to throw out the ones that are determinable, if that makes sense. So both parties need good random number generators. Yes, yes, they need perfect random number generators. And what would they be based on? Thermal noise? Thermal noise, avalanche, di uh, av um, avalanche mm -hmm. breakdown. Um, there are quantum ones that use optical methods. The iPhone. Uh, yeah, there's another one um, that someone has done using um, noise in a camera. Um, so someone's tried doing that with a mobile phone camera. And one interesting thing is that the pixel densities have gotten down so low. So when you've got, say, a 40 megapixel camera, with a sensor that's becoming really quite unreasonably small, then it turns out that the when you're in the dark, the light coming in is into each pixel is only really a few photons, and so you end up with shot noise that's measurable in each pixel, and so that provides a source of good randomness too. Wow. Um, another question is: Your experiment was done with a very short length of cable. Yes. What? What do you think are the prospects for secure communication in this way with really practical long lengths of several kilometres? What happens then? Well, that's where the issues of propagation delay come into play. However, in this case, the uh, main issue with length was to do with loss. And it turns out there are countermeasures that can deal with that. It's not entirely clear exactly how you're going to implement that countermeasure because so you need to adjust this voltage here to compensate for that resistance, but you need to somehow measure that resistance in a secure way that an eavesdropper can't interfere with. Um, but when you get longer cables, you have issues with propagation times, and so this model, again, isn't accurate and there will be some degradation of security. But you can also counter that by reducing your bandwidth even further, which essentially electrically shortens the line. 
You just gave me an evil thought there. If I'm an intruder and I've got access, I can break the physical integrity of that barrier. <coughs> yes. Can I jiggle the resistance a bit by adding a bit of my own? And then their compensation won't be correctly adjusted anymore and then it will leak information. Yeah, so that's one possibility. I mean, it's not clear whether you can securely uh, measure that. It might be that you can be clever if you've agreed on, say, a code in advance, then you can use some sort of CDMA type thing mm. and try to flip the sign of your measurement uh, of your measurement signal back every now and then so that you can detect whether an eavesdropper is interfering. Mm. Uh, so there is, there is that sort of thing that you could perhaps do. Um, but again, at this point, it's not entirely clear uh, the best way to go about doing that. I guess my final thought is that this system does seem to degrade slowly. Is it, it's not total catastrophe that just leaks information at a certain rate. Is that a fair comment or is that? Uh, uh, yes, well, uh, all attacks known, that's been the case. Yeah. Um, it's possible that later there'll be an attack found in which uh, it'll just suddenly become possible to deterministically determine what those resistors are. But it's not clear at all just how you would go about doing that. And that's why I find this system very interesting. There's a big gulf between uh, what should theoretically be possible and what's practically possible. And it raises a question that maybe the theoretical analysis is based on an incorrect model or perhaps in practice it's not actually feasible to implement the attack, in which case this would provide a meaningful form of security. Final question. All right, if there are no more questions, let's uh, give Lockham a big hand. Thank you.